Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Craig Werner. I'm the president of the Nepean District Historical Society. And today we're celebrating the 150th anniversary of Penrith Council. Now we would be doing this live, but unfortunately COVID-19 has conspired against us. So we're doing it in a different format. So hopefully I'll be able to anticipate the questions that you would normally be able to ask me live and throw those into this presentation. So today Penrith is a thriving metropolis. It's located 51 kilometres or 31 miles west of Sydney. And it was actually in the Federal Division of Lindsay, which was named after Norman Albert Lindsay, who uh, died in 1969. He was a prominent painter. He was a novelist and he was also an artist and he was most famous for creating the magic pudding. Now, if we go back to the very beginnings of Penrith, you have to go back to 1789. And Captain Watkin Tench was exploring the Nepean River with an Aboriginal guide and he came across a section um, that he described as being as wide as the Thames at Putney. Um, and that then became the basis for where Penrith was established. So Macquarie had set aside 10 towns. Um, Penrith, unfortunately, was not one of those towns, but five of those towns now reside within the Penrith LGA. Now, it took a while for um, Penrith to become established, even after it was discovered. So the first land grants in Penrith weren't actually until 1803. And the land grants were to fairly prominent landholders around the area, including uh, Marines and free settlers. Now, prior to that, Penrith had a prison farm at Emu Plains that had been there since around 1813. Um, and that farm, prison farm, still continues to operate today, although it's actually now a women's farm. Um, so we have a sketch looking down from the hills above, looking down across the plains, and you can actually see the prison farm in the background. So now one of the things that the prison farm was fairly good for, because the land is very fertile along the plains of the Nepean River, um, they were actually growing food uh, at the prison farm to help sustain the colony at the time. Because you've got to bear in mind that when they came to Australia, they brought lovely English wet weather crops to a very dry, arid climate. And unfortunately, in the early stages of the colony, they were actually starving. Um, so by the time they started working with the local Aboriginals, they worked out what would grow, what wouldn't grow, and Windsor and Penrith became major food bowls for the rest of the colony. Now, the oldest church in the area is actually um, St Paul's, which was part of the prison farm. Um, and it's the oldest church in the Nepean area. So, in 1813, Blacksland, Lawson and Wentworth were the first people to actually discover a serviceable route over the Blue Mountains and onto the plains at Bathurst. Um, and then a year later, Macquarie instructed them to actually begin construction of a road. But these, these three men were actually given land grants at South Creek for establishing that roadway and for surveying it. So Governor Macquarie on the 14th of July in 1814 asked his friend William Cox to establish a road from Penrith across the Blue Mountains. And he was said that the number of artificers and labourers, 30, a guard of eight soldiers and yourself are required and your services forthwith. So the, secondly, the road must be at least 12 foot wide as to permit two carts to pass each other. The timber in the forest is to be ground and cleared away 20 foot wide and all holes are to be filled or completely eliminated to allow passing without difficulty or damage to the carriages. 
Now, if you go back and you look today, you can still actually see parts of the road. Um, if you walk up over the mountains, you can see the trails that were actually cut into the stone because they did have a number of stone cutters with them. And as you get further onto the plains, you can actually see the old roads. Most of it though, unfortunately today, is on private property. Now, Penrith started to become more established. So in 1817, Penrith was deemed large enough to actually have its own courthouse. Now the courthouse that they first built was actually in High Street and would be today opposite Nicholas of Myra, where the current police station is. Years later, it was actually swapped and the courthouse moved to Henry Street and the police station moved to High Street. So they basically swapped positions. Now, Penrith continued to grow over the years. So in 1828, it got its first dedicated post office and Alexander Fraser took up the post on the 8th of March in 1828. St Stephen's Church, the stones began laying for those in around 1837 and that still stands as an iconic structure at the top of High Street today. Of course though, when you go to church on Sunday it's a little bit different back then than it is today. So you would get dressed in your finest and you would take your sulky out and hop on board and down to the church in your Sunday sulky, they called it. So for those that were fairly affluent, they would normally have two carts on the farm. The sulky, which was your very lightweight, and the one that they used to take to the church on Sunday. And then they had a spring cart, which would today be equivalent of the ute to use around the farm. So for the heavier work, obviously. Uh, now in 1815, Penrith got its first hospital. So St Joseph Convent, also known as the first hospital or Penrith Cottage Hospital, was established. Today, if you go and look at the office work site in High Street, that is where it used to be. Um, the original cottage hospital then moved over to Lemon Grove and became Governor Phillip Special Hospital. And that was built in around 1895. Now, Today, they've retained a couple of things in the Governor Philip Special Hospital. And for those of you with a keen eye, if you look at the top of the main tower at the front of the building, you'll see a wind chime. And if you don't know, take a really good look because when the wind catches it at a certain angle, you'll actually see it's a replica of the Endeavour. 1862, Westpac comes to Penrith, or back in the old days, the Bank of New South Wales. So it came along and now we had banking for the masses. Of course, Penrith continued to grow and at this stage in 1852, Toby Ryan decided that it was time to have a permanent bridge going from Penrith to Emu Plains so that trade could continue to traffic. Now, Toby Ryan lived at a property called Emu Hall, which is just on the Emu Plains side of the Victoria Bridge. Now, running up the side of his place is a street called Punt Lane, and that's where they used to run the punts from there across to where the old log cabin was. Um, now, there also used to be a small island there um, when they originally set it up, probably no more than two metres by two metres. Unfortunately, there were a number of floods over the years and that has subsequently washed away. But what they did was they set up a company called the Penrith Nepean Bridge Company. And they would charge you a toll depending on what you were taking across. So for every person crossing the bridge, it was one pence. And for vehicles with two wheels, four pence but you could only be charged once a day. That was their regulations. Now, Penrith continued to expand. And of course, the rail line was extended in 1863 to Penrith itself. And if you have a look at the Penrith rail yard today, they actually do have a turntable there where they used to turn the locomotives and the coal chutes around so that they could head back up to Sydney. Unfortunately though, um, 
By this time, the first bridge across the Nepean River had been washed away. They had built a second bridge in 1859. Unfortunately though, the same thing happened, it got washed away. So they shot the engineer for being careless. Not really, but they were tempted to. So what they did was they actually called in a proper engineer, the same gentleman who actually built the Brooklyn Bridge just north of Hornsby. And he came in and he took one look at the property and went, there's your problem. You're sitting your piers on top of clay. And of course the clay is not stable. So what happens is when the water comes down, bang, it just washes it away. And if you're an intrepid explorer and you like to go to the downside of the weir at Penrith, have a look in the peat on the bottom of the river and you may even discover one of the timber joists that held up the original bridges. Now, they began construction on that and a lot of people say, well, it's got those high sides on it. Now, the high sides were kept there for um, one reason and that was to prevent anything falling into the water and also to protect the trains that used to go over that bridge. Because at that point you had a dual bridge, so it was running a rail line and it was also running traffic. Um, and by the way, some people think there's a rumour going round that they lost one of those side pieces and they had to pinch one from Russia. Not correct. They actually got all of them. Uh, they ended up having to get a replacement for one that was lost at sea, but they didn't actually take it from Russia. Now, in 1870, you had now all the traffic coming over the Blue Mountains and they were bringing stock across. So they had huge bullock trains and the bullock trains themselves would be as tall as I am and probably five to 10 meters in length and they would weigh several tons. They would have anywhere up to 14 to 18 bullocks or Clydesdales pulling these enormous wagons. Now you have to bear in mind that these wagons are not like your modern wagons where you can just step on the brake. So what they did, because they had very large families, because you can't afford to hire labour, so you grow all your own labour, and they'd take the smallest child and they'd sit him right on the very top. So one of these wagons could hold 120 bales of wheat or hay. Um, so they'd have the child sit up the very top and he would then have one of his brothers standing at the front wheel and one brother standing at the back wheel and they have hand crank brakes. So as they're coming to a rise in the road, the youngest brother would say going up and then they'd apply a little bit of pressure so that it didn't get dragged. And as they were coming down the, the, the dips, they would apply a little bit more pressure so the wagons wouldn't run away and obviously run over the bullocks or the Clydesdales that they had. So that was one of their jobs. So everybody in the family works, okay. Now, in 1871, Penrith becomes a municipality and James Riley becomes the first mayor of Penrith. And that was from 1871 to 1874. Now the name Penrith actually comes from a town called Penrith in Cumbria. And it actually means chief or head ford. Now, it was the main crossing point of the Nepean River. So that's how the name Penrith came to be chosen as the name of the municipality. For those of you that ever went to Penrith High School, you would know that there's a magazine called The Towers. Well, The Towers was actually a property that was built back in 1880 on the exact site of the high school uh, and later converted for use as a high school. It stood there abandoned for many years, uh, but it was then uh, retasked and obviously turned into the high school. Now in 1890, Penrith got lucky. They became the third city outside Sydney after Tamworth and Young to get electricity to the entire town. Now, business continued to expand and what they were doing was that they've now decided they needed a dedicated rail bridge. 
because at the moment we're still running passengers and trains on the same, but the roads are getting busier, obviously, as Penrith becomes a bustling metropolis now. So in 1907, they began construction of a dedicated rail bridge. And that was then completed in 1908. Now, in the 1920s, Penrith High Street continued growing. And if you were out walking around, you would see vendor horse-drawn wagons everywhere. So everything from the grocer, to the milkman, to the butcher, to the baker, would all have their little carts going around Penrith, delivering your goods. So back to the day, and COVID has now forced this on us, of home delivery. So we've gone backwards. So we've gone from home delivery to pick it up yourself, and now back to home delivery. All in the space of 90, 100 years, 101 years this year, so. Now, they had a number of different businesses in Penrith, so you get everything that you could imagine. You could come into Penrith and you could get your horse shoes replaced. You could get glass cut. You could even go to your taverns and pubs. You could go to your produce markets and all of those things were now available. Now, the other thing too is that High Street continued to grow and initially the road was all dirt all the way down. Now, when they'd first laid the water pipes in Penrith, they'd actually laid them under the roadway and the water pipes that they laid were actually made from wood and sealed with tar. So from time to time, if they sprung a leak, you'd have these dirty great puddles up High Street. And of course, now Penrith is growing. They were looking at trying to solve this issue. So eventually in about 1932, they actually moved the pipes under the sidewalk and used ceramic based pipes for those. The other thing too, is that if you ever stroll down High Street, take a look from one side of the street across to the other and look above the awnings and you can still see some of the old facades on the buildings right up High Street from the corner of Castle Ray Street all the way down. If you look on both sides, you can still see those old facades. In fact, some of the buildings have still survived. Um, and if you go right down to the very bottom of Penrith, um, where the pop-up park is there, you can actually see if you stand on the Penrith Westfield side, and you look across to the other side, you can actually see the scroll work above the awnings on the street. So just something to have a look at next time you're strolling through Penrith. Now, obviously Penrith continued to grow and the um, Australian Arms Hotel on the corner of Evans Street and High Street had been established and it also had accommodation. Now, it's still there today, but it's slightly modified in appearance. Back in the 1920s, it actually had timber facades around the top, and you could actually stand out on the top deck and look over Penrith while you were sitting, drinking, enjoying yourself. The other thing too, is that uh, you can continue looking down at the major intersections, and you can see the changes that have happened over quite a number of years. The other thing too, is that because we now have the rail line to Penrith, Penrith now became a tourist destination. And a lot of Sydney siders would come out to Penrith and then they would either stay at Penrith or they would go out to Wallachia where there were quite a number of guest houses and they would have their relaxing weekend or they would take the week out. Now, there's two ways they could go. There was a bus that would take you out to Wallachia or you could take a standard boat which is basically a very, very long um, wide boat with a single motor at the back, steered by a giant arm. Um, and it had covers across the top. So you could take those back and forth from where the rowing club is, right up to Wallachia. Now in 1929, Penrith got its first dedicated ambulance station. Um, not in the location that it's down at, um, opposite the tennis courts, um, it was predating where it was put into the tennis courts there, so. Now, people continued to come to Penrith and 
the weir was a popular attraction. So in 1934, you would start to see all these people in their neck to knee bathers. Of course, you had to be conservative. There was no two piece swimsuits back then. It was neck to knee or out you go. So we've got some shots here of the standard boats bringing people down to the rowing club so that they could then go and sit on the wall of the weir and enjoy the sun, dip their feet in the water, have a good time. And in the background, you can see the bridges as well. So, but Penrith continued to expand and became a very sporting community. So everything from the Penrith Waratahs uh, football club, the Penrith Golf Club that we used to meet at Thornton Hall, and the Nepean District Cricket Association. And in Penrith, we have the Howl Oval, which was actually named after the first international cricketer, um, George Howell, who was raised in Penrith. The other thing we also had was a speedway. So in 1925, you could go to the Penrith Motor Speedway Carnival. And they had all of the latest cars racing around on these speedways with spectators watching the latest vehicles that have just come out. Now, the speedway was located on the far side of Penrith, or so on the north side of Penrith, um, where the army land used to be. The other thing that people don't realise is that Penrith actually had its own airstrip. And again, that was also on the North Army land side of Penrith. And these were set up after the First World War as a precaution. Emu Plains also had an airstrip as well. And they were trying to make as many of these around the place as possible so that if anything happened, they had places where they could park their planes away from the main bases if they ever came under attack. Now, Businesses in Penrith continued to grow, and one of the biggest businesses in Penrith was the Penrith Coombs Cordial Factory. Now, it had been running for 53 years in 1920, and it's located on Station Street today, where the Senior Citizens Centre would be. So, unfortunately, um, it didn't survive into the modern era, but it did provide cordials for over 60 years to Penrith. So. Now, the other thing too is that Penrith had its own newspaper. So from 1882 till 1962, the Nepean Times would bring you all the current news and the ads that came with it. They had reporters going around and looking up and filling this newspaper so that you could buy those newspapers and get your daily updates. You didn't now have to wait for the carriages to come from Sydney and get your news two to three months later. You could now get it fairly quickly. Now, by 1940, um, horses and carts basically had vanished and they were being replaced systematically by the automobile. So if you look at High Street in the 1940s, you will rarely see a horse-drawn wagon, but you will see lots of different cars coming through. Now also in 1932, Memorial Park got an update as well. Um, and it was upgraded from the original one that was built in 1922. And they put in um, these new covered walkways and the palms all went in as well around there. So people could come in, sit there, and then you would have the memorials so that people could reflect on those situations. Now it's obviously been updated over the years and today we have a more modernized version, but again, it still retains those plaques with all those names from the people of Penrith. Now in 1940, Penrith gets its new fire station. It's a solid brick construction and it's designed to be fairly sturdy because obviously you don't want your fire station burning down on you. Bit of a problem there if it does. Then it was modernised again um, about 15 years ago and it's the still fire station you see today on the opposite corner from Officeworks. Now, in the 1970s, 
we had the Penrith Plaza. And for those of you that remember shopping then, back in those days, it was a single level, bell laid out, take you five hours to walk around it, and loads of shops. But over the years, it expanded and continued, and today we have a two-story monolith called Westfield. But originally it started out as a single story. So again, progress, more shops, more opportunities to buy. Now, in 1958, Penrith Council Chambers were located on the corner of Station Street and Henry Street. In 1993, Penrith Council decided that they need something a bit larger to take themselves into the future and they purchased a site at the bottom end of High Street. And so from 1993 through to the present day, Penrith has operated from its brand new facility that is at the bottom end of High Street. Now, the other thing too is that Penrith still had a Walton store as well. Um, eventually that was swallowed up by the Westfield shopping complex and Westfield went from being on one block to two blocks to basically three blocks wide. Now, the other thing that I've also given you here to have a look at is some of the ads from yesteryear. So some of the things that you would have seen in the Nepean times were ads for watches, jewelry, um, tourists, if you want to go to England, what trains to catch, Pioneers, Commonwealth Savings Bank, the Great Australian Bank, and also, for those of you that are interested, Kodak cameras, the old box brownie type. Also, there were some ads for the guest houses that were here in Penrith, including Huntington Hall, which is on um, Nepean Road, and also Pioneer Motor Tours of Australia. So that sort of gives you a bit of background on the history of Penrith. So I hope that that's sort of helped you to understand a little bit about where Penrith has come from. So we've come from having five or six land grants of large size to now having over 200,000 people in Penrith and being a major regional centre. So thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.